You're listening to AM Now, an Accounting Matters podcast. I'm your host, Adam Olson. And I'm Nicole Harker. There's been a lot of activity on the standard setting front over the last week. Today, we'll discuss the FASB's issuance of its first accounting standard update in 2023, as well at, yeah, I know, <laughs> as well as an exposure draft for the accounting for crypto assets. Speaking of exposure drafts, we will also discuss matters on an international front, looking at the IASB's recently issued exposure draft for proposed amendments to the classification and measurement of financial instruments under IFRS 7 and 9. We'll top things off by discussing the SEC's recent proposal to modernize the submission of certain forms and end with an update from the state of Texas on the previous story about the hours requirement for CPA licensure. Nicole? You want to start us off and tell us a little bit about this new standard update from the VASB? <laughs> Gladly. You can tell I'm really excited. <laughs> um, actually, Adam, this common control lease arrangement update was one of the first stories we touched on in our very first episode of AN Now. So it's nice to see this one cross the finish line. Um, since the standard is now final, let's give a brief overview of the finalized standard ASU 2023-01, which covers common control lease arrangements. The new standards allows private and not-for-profit entities to elect as a practical expedient to use the written terms and conditions of a common control arrangement to determine whether a lease exists and if so, the classification for the lease. Yeah, the new standard also provides guidance on determining the amortization of the leasehold improvement associated with common control lease arrangements. This portion of the standard update is applicable for all reporting entities. Yep, and the, the ASU is effective beginning fiscal years and interim periods beginning after December 15th, 2023. Early adoption is permitted. Um, if an entity does adopt the amendment in an interim period, it must adopt the amendment as of the beginning of the fiscal year that includes that interim period. And speaking of new standards, we've finally seen some movement on the fast-moving crypto asset project leading to the FASB issuing its exposure draft last week for the accounting for and disclosures of crypto assets. The proposed standard update applies to crypto assets that meet all six of the following criteria. The crypto asset must meet the definition of an intangible asset. It does not provide the asset holder with enforceable rights to or claims on underlying goods, services, or other assets. They're created or reside on a distributed ledger based on blockchain technology. They're secured through cryptography. They're fungible. And lastly, they are not created or issued by the reporting entity or its related party. <clears throat> companies would be required to measure crypto assets that meet these criteria at the fair value with changes recognized in net income at each reporting period. Any transaction costs incurred to acquire a crypto asset, so commissions or other transaction fees, would be expensed as incurred unless applicable industry-specific guidance requires these costs to be capitalized. And the standard would also require an, ent an entity to present crypto assets measured at fair value separately from other intangible assets on the balance sheet, and then changes in the fair value measurement would also be recorded separately from changes in the carrying amounts of other intangible assets in the income statement. The only change the standard made to cash flows is if crypto assets are received as non-cash consideration in the ordinary course of business and are converted nearly immediately into cash, an entity would be required to classify those cash receipts as cash flows from operating activities. So an example of this would be crypto assets received in exchange for the transfer of goods and services to a customer. Adam, what are the proposed disclosure requirements? Glad you asked. So for <laughs> annual and interim periods, entities would be required to disclose the name, cost basis, fair value, and number of units for each significant crypto asset holding, and the aggregate fair values and cost basis of the crypto asset holdings that are not individually significant. In addition for crypto assets subject to restrictions, entities must disclose the fair value of those crypto assets, the nature and remaining duration of the restrictions, and the circumstances that co could cause those restrictions to lapse. Entities would also be required to disclose a roll forward of activity in the period for crypto asset holdings, including additions along with a description of the activities that resulted in the additions, dispositions, gains, and losses. 
If gains and losses are not presented separately on the income statement, the entity is required to disclose the line item in which the gains or losses are recorded. For any dispositions that occur during the reporting period, an entity must disclose the difference between the sale price and the cost basis and a description of the activities that resulted in the disposition. An entity must also disclose the method for determining the cost basis of the crypto assets. The proposed update would also require impacted entities to record a cumulative effect adjustment to the opening balance of retained earnings as of the beginning of the annual reporting period in which the entity adopts the proposed amendments. Early adoption would be allowed in any interim or annual reporting period for which the entity's financial statements have not been issued as of the beginning of the annual reporting period. The exposure draft will be open for comment until June 6 for those interested in weighing in on the final standard setting around crypto assets. Moving along, the IASB also issued an exposure draft of their own last week, focusing on the accounting for financial instruments. Specifically, the proposed update clarifies that entities are required to apply settlement date accounting when derecognizing a financial asset or liability and allows an entity to deem a financial liability that is settled using electronic payment system to be discharged before the settlement date if specified criteria are met. In addition, the proposed update clarified the application guidance for assessing the contractual cash flow characteristics of financial assets, including those financial assets with contractual terms that could change the timing or the amount of the contractual cash flow. For example, those financial instruments with ESG linked features, also financial assets with non-recourse features, and finally, financial assets that are contractually linked instruments. The proposed update also made amendments or additions to the disclosure requirements for financial instruments under IFRS 7. Specifically, the enhanced disclosure requirements are for investments in equity instruments designated at fair value through other comprehensive income and financial instruments with contractual terms that could change the timing or the amount of contractual cash flows on the occurrence or non-occurrence of a contingent event. Comments on this exposure draft are due by July 19th. And we can't leave the SEC out this no, we week. Can't. <laughs> so last week, the SEC proposed to modernize the submission of certain forms, filings, and materials. Specifically, SEC Chair Gary Gensler said, we live in a digital age. In 2023, one might think that all filings of the, to the commission already could be made electronically. That's not yet true. Today, we have the important opportunity to require electronic filing for nearly all of the remaining paper filings required under the Exchange Act. I believe the proposal, if adopted, will save both registrants and the Commission time and resources. And speaking of the SEC, they recently approved the 2023 U.S. GAAP Financial Reporting Taxonomy and the 2023 SEC Reporting Taxonomy for XBRL reporting, and the FASB has released both for public use. The 2023 GRT contains updates for amendments from accounting standards and other improvements since last year. The 2023 SRT updates primarily relate to improvements for SE staff accounting bulletin number 121 on obligations to safeguard crypto assets that an entity holds for platform users. Interesting stuff there. So <laughs> to round us out this week, we previously reported that NASBA reaffirmed its support for the 150 hour education requirement for CPA licensure nationwide. As a follow up, the state of Texas recently advanced legislation that allows CPA candidates to sit for the CPA exam earlier with only 120 hours. That's right, Adam. The Texas Senate unanimously passed a bill that would lower the eligibility requirement to sit for the CPA exam to 100 120 hours. The bill now advances to the Texas House of Representatives for a vote. Legislators obviously believe this will help fuel the perceived struggling CPA pipeline. But to be clear, the bill would allow candidates to sit for their CPA exam earlier. However, the candidate would still be required to complete the 150 hour education requirement in order to receive their actual CPA license from the state board. Thanks, Nicole. For a deeper dive into what's trending in accounting and finance, check out our other podcast on the Accounting Matters feed on your preferred listening platform. Again, I'm Adam Olson. And I'm Nicole Harger. 
Thanks for listening to AM Now. We'll see you next week. 